speak of the day, uh, Professor Alexei Mashnikov from the Civil Institute of Technology, and he's going to tell us something about exotic funds generated with residual finance. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here and give a talk. And since it's recorded, I will say something inappropriate, <laughs> usually. Um, so it's two parts. The first, it will be uh, finally gener generate the residual finite groups, uh, which are recursively presented. And I will try to show that there are really bad groups there. And the second part is uh, finitely presented residually finite groups. And uh, I will show that you can construct arbitrary then functions. Complexity of the word problems could be arbitrary, and the depth functions could be arbitrary uh, within the limits which is supposed to be. Uh, so two parts of it. Mm. I don't know. Uh, the first slide probably is not important, but just notation. F of x is free group with basis x. This mean x generate g. Word problem I will denote by WP. It's uh, all words from f of x which are equal to 1 in g. And it's decidable if there exists an algorithm which decides for a given word whether it's trivial in the group or not. And uh, in most cases, I will consider not only total algorithms, but also partial ones when they they are not all, all on the set of all words, but just on some subset. Uh, it's, uh, it comes from computer science, actually, uh, under the influence of modern cryptography, that uh, there is a change of the kind of uh, philosophy. It's interesting not only to, to prove that something is very easy, more interesting actually now sometimes to find difficult examples, hard instances. So I would like to, to try to see what are finely generated groups with the worst possible word problem uh, in terms of what can we decide about uh, equality of two elements in such groups. And of course, the best would be that you, you can decide nowhere. It means if you have a partial algorithm, uh, it, it, it answers on some pairs of words, and the set it should be very, very small. Um, the best would be empty. Empty is not possible, but something like that. So to measure where it where it's decides, I need some uh, measure um, on the set of inputs in the set of all words. So a typical thing is you have all words in the finite alphabet, say i. i n is the sphere of uh, radius n. And you define rho of n of s. It's uh, if, if you have uniform distribution on i n what's the probability to hit, a, to hit an element from S. And if you take the limit, lim sub, you'll have the asymptotic density of a subset S. So that's how you measure. It's very approximate, but big sets which have asymptotic density 1, small sets which have asymptotic density 0. And intuitively, it's clear. So if Asymptotically, it's very difficult to hit an element in S. Um, OK, sorry. Uh, one more thing. It's not on the slide. But it could be, in principle, that the limit is 1, but uh, it goes to the limit very, very slowly. So it's not very uh, practical. So I will say. It's strongly generic set. So asymptotic density 1, its set is generic. It means most of, of the set of inputs. Strongly generic or exponentially generic if convergence is exponentially fast. It means 
very quickly this frequency is close to one. Now, <coughs> of course, there are groups, finitely presented groups uh, with undecidable word problem. Most of the examples we know, uh, the word problem is decidable there on a generic set easily. So, worst case complexity, it means it's undecidable, but in most inputs it's trivial most of the time. So, it should be some different approach. So, a finely generated group is algorithmically finite if there is no any algorith algorithmic way to produce an infinite set of pairwise distinct elements of G. So it's much more actually than just solving the word problem. It's, you, you can do it on infinite sort of set. More formally it's a group G is, is logarithmically finite if for every infinite computably enumerable subset W there exists a pair it means it's infinitely many such pairs of distinct words there which define the same element. So if you have any algorithm to produce mm, such, such pairs, its halting set, the set where it, it stops, will be computably enumerable. So it's not any restriction, it's just formally more, a bit more formal what it said. So you can produce infinite set pairwise distinct elements. That, that's, that's kind of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are finite groups, of course, which is not interesting. So, uh, and uh, the proof is Denise Ossian that there exists recursively presented infinite, infinite algorithmically finite non-amenable groups. And... Uh, then with uh, Bahadur Husseinov, we, uh, we added that residually finite even P groups. So it's kind of strange thing. Residually finite in P group, it's supposed to be very, uh, very tame. So everything is good about it. Still. So you don't mean that the group itself is a P group? You mean that residually finite P groups. Yeah. I think you can do P groups too. Mm. I, I, I will say a few words about the construction. So it means <coughs> crucial here, of course, recursively presented. If it would be finely presented, of course, there are no such groups. But if you have recursively presented, you can have them. And the property of such groups is precisely what I said. every computable, computably enumerable subset with decidable equality problem. So it's, if you have some partial decision algorithm for equality problem in the group, partial, so it, its halting set is some computably enumerable set. You decide equality problem. It's negligible. It means its asymptotic, asymptotic density is zero. And if the group is non-abinable, then it's actually exponentially negligible. So it's, it goes to zero exponentially fast. In other words, you really can decide almost, you can decide nothing on these groups in terms of the word problem. That's, uh, that seems like the worst possible example. Uh, of course, uh, there is, there is a, can we construct find the presented ones or not? That's a question. And it's very, very easy to see that every infinite algorithmically finite group is periodic. Because if you take arbitrary word and consider its powers, of course it's computerly enumerable because you can. So since it's algorithmically finite, two such powers should define the same word, the same element in the group. So every element is periodic. So constructing finitely presented infinite algorithmically finite group in particular will give you a solution to very old and big problem to construct infinite 
periodic fine represented group if it exists. So improvement possible but cannot be easy. So we call such problems and now it's in recursion theory people use this term absolutely undecidable. It means whatever is decided measure zero. Mm. And what we it's, uh, to construct them we used uh, Golod Shafarevich construction of infinite periodic groups. Modification of course. So there is a very nice way to add relations such that uh, you keep the group infinite. And how you do, how you add relations, it's a post-construction of Im immune sets or simple sets from recursion theory. So you combine two things and, and you got these groups. Interesting part is there are Turing machines there some, somehow, but they are not universal Turing machines. Universal Turing machines, that's the main source of uh, undecidability or hardness in, in group theory quite often. They are not there. It's, it's actually more, uh, more uh, sophisticated construction, po post-construction of immune sets. So, um, so this is the first example where the problem is absolutely undecidable and finitely generated recursively presented groups. Now the question is, can we do better? Ah, that's, that's yeah, I, I said that. I, I didn't mean this. That's what I want. Uh, can we construct then monsters where the word problem is undecidable even on finite sets? And of course, uh, formally speaking, we can because uh, Finite sets by definition are computable. So whatever you have finite, it's, uh, there is some algorithm uh, to answer all questions about a finite set. And nevertheless, let, let's try. And you will see that not everything is that easy. So I need a little bit of uh, some definition. If you have a finite set by D of S, I don't know the size of a shortest Turing machine program that enumerates S. It's like Kolmogorov complexity, just for finite sets. People didn't consider it, but it's convenient in this uh, framework. So then you can consider compression. It's a cardinality of S, finite set, sets are finite, divided by the size of the shortest Turing machine program which enumerates S. And, and it's easy to see that you can construct effectively a sequence of finite sets such that compression grows as much as you really want. So there are a lot of compressible sets. So that's what I'm saying. In any case, <coughs> Suppose one has to solve a search problem in some finite compu commut computably enumerable set S. If the size of S is about the same as the size of the program, shortest program, a shortest program for S, that basically what you, what you can do only is just do the brute force. Anything you do with the set is a brute force. It means you, even you can't even enumerate anything. So your enumeration in this case, you say this is the first element, this is the second element. You have list of elements, nothing smarter than that. So it's uh, incompressible or algorithmically in invisible or brute force sets. It's interesting that uh, in the 60s, especially in, in Mm. Kubernetes at that time in Russia was popular discussion about what, what are brute what is brute force, and uh, people they decided that the, the best answer was NP-complete problems. So 
So in p-complete problems, kind of people agreed, like Cook and Levin, <coughs> introduced by Cook and Levin, it's uh, the best approximation of brute force problems. But actually, I think this approach is actually, it might be better in some instances, for example, in the word problem. So, so why is it the only way? Hmm? Uh, the only way you think is to switch the elements? Yeah, because. Uh, okay. I mean, maybe there is. Uh, <coughs> no, but it. Yeah, but it, it basically it means that the, you see your, your program is just line one, line two, and so on. So number of lines is the same as the number of the elements in the set. But still, you might not. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Some other description, right? Yes. Yeah, but uh, the definition of G of S is uh, the small of possible size of all possible no. algorithms. What they are saying that could be different listing sort of of the elements. Yeah, but it's a, when you think about <laughs> listing as enumeration, every line uh, sort of lists an element. Uh, so, yeah, formally speaking, is I don't know, listing is not quite precise, maybe. In any case, uh, it's, it's if you think about computability, if the space is, if you're trying to solve word problem or something else on the search space, like in cryptography, you're trying to, to break a key. If the space is large and incompressible, then you can actually, you cannot even to show this program to, to your computer because it's too long. So, so it's, it's not about computation even. It's, it's, uh, it's just too long to, to represent it for your computer. In other words, for example, you can forget about such keys in cryptography because you can't generate them. So you, you, you just cannot start the proce generating procedure because um, the program is too long. So from my viewpoint, in computer world, such incompressible finest sets, it, it's just not there. You can forget about them. But if you forget about them, you can prove the, the following theorem, which is improvement on. It's much much worse than the Dan monsters we constructed with Denis Sotin and Hader Husseinov. There exists a finitely generated recursively represented finite residually finite group, and a constant c such that for every in this case, finite or infinite computer enumerable set. If its size is larger than double exponential, double exponent of uh, its description, Kolmogorov description, then there exists a pair of distinct words in this set which define the same element. So you can get rid of infinite sets. You can actually do more. You just need to do For brute force sets, unfortunately, here it's double exponent. So this this so is. As a practical matter, even a single word of double exponential length. Oh. No, it's uh, the set. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I'm thinking about like you take a random word of length n and you take the set of all prefixes, right? So oh. That is roughly speaking of cardinality n, but. If this n is itself some kind of double exponential, so that's yeah, right. Often beyond the computational capacity yeah, of, sure. uh, of computers in the world, right? Right. Unless there is kind of very, very much recursion in this, in this world. So um, it would be interesting to, to get to one exponent. One exponent. I don't think you can construct anything less than one exponent. Even uh, this post-construction for numbers, which is much easier. Uh, it enumerates all student machine, and the, it does something similar. Uh, in a, one exponent on the index of the machine. 
since there are exponentially many machines, indexes grow exponentially with respect to the size of the program. So it's improvement can be just one, one, one exponent, not, not two. And anyway, so currently that's the worst, the worst groups you can, you can construct with respect to uh, the word problem, difficulty of the word problem. And it's uh, all known groups with undecidable word problem up to now was were constructed using universal Turing machines. And for universal Turing machines, they're not good because the halting problem for universal Turing machines generically is very easy. It's, uh, it's linear time. So halting problem is difficult, but generically it's, it's easy. Okay, that's, uh, that's the, the, there are applications of this group now. I don't want to get into it, but um, that's the worst possible group uh, which are recursively presented, residually finite. Now I would like to talk about finitely presented, residually finite groups. Uh, so there are several um, standard questions. How hard could be the word problem? In, I don't know what is F, there is no F here. In G, how large could be the den function of G? How large could, could be the gap between the complexity of the word problem and the den function? And what is the time complexity of the classical mckinsey maltsev should be mckinsey maltsev algorithm for the word problem. I will discuss it. And how large could be the depth function? Uh, so the second part, it's uh, based on joint results with Olga Harlampovich and Mark Sapir. And I will try to explain what, what, we get, what we've got here. So all the problems basically we solved all the questions like that we solved. It could be the word problems. So the groups are residually finite and finitely presented. The word problem is always decidable. But within the realm of computable functions, it could be arbitrary high, arbitrary difficult. Arbitrary large recursive den functions, arbitrary large gaps, arbitrary large depth functions. And the groups happen to be solvable of class three, even though we didn't, we didn't, we didn't need it really. What we wanted, it's fine to present it. So as a motivation, even though the questions which uh, I just considered, they, they are, some of them are part of geometric group theory, which is not related really to computation, but still. So, Residually finite, finitely presented groups are supposed to be uh, much easier than just finitely presented. The word problem is always decidable, as I said. And there is a general uniform algorithm. Usually it's called Maltsev algorithm, but Maltsev in his paper uh, refers to McKinsey, which is a, some paper on logic, and he extracted, I don't know, uh, the algorithm from McKinsey, even though I looked at McKinsey paper, it's multi could extract, but maybe not many other uh, people. Anyway, so the algorithm is well known. Most of the results and the decidability of the word problem mm, up to 80s, I think, were basically like that using this algorithm. So what the algorithm is? So it, the set of inputs, it consists of two parts, the word problem and its complement, all words which are not equal to one in, in G. So the mckinsey maltsev algorithm, it runs two different algorithms. One, A, yes, and it stops if and only if W is trivial in the word problem. And the other one stops only if W is not trivial. 
and they are both partial algorithms. So you just run two partial algorithms in parallel. And the first one just enumerates one by one all consequences of defining relations, which are products of conjugates of relators, relations from R. R is finite, so you, you just enumerate all, all consequences and given your word double, you just see whether it appears in the list. Appears, you reduce whatever you got in the list and you should see W. And if it's equal to one, you will see it. And the other one actually enumerates all homomorphisms into finite groups and waits until some image of W is not one. For example, you can enumerate just in SN symmetric groups. Since it's finitely presented, you can see, you can really check whether given map is a homomorphism or not. So it's, it's a procedure, two procedures. So complexity of these algorithms were not known. But uh, as Gromov writes, 10 function is kind of witness of complexity of the yes part of the word problem. And the depth function, which I'll define a few slides below, estimate the complexity of the algorithm of no part. So this is a den function. As I said, what is trivial in the group if it's a, it's equal in the free group, it's equal to the product like that, product of conjugates of relators. The area of W is a minimal such n. There are, could be many decompositions of W like that. And as usual, you can define the the corresponding function, which is called the den function of the presentation, actually. It's a maximal area of words, trivial words, trivial in the group words of length at most 10. And uh, the depth function somehow formally I think people, of course, considered it before, but formally was introduced and studied by Bohr IB just several years ago. So what is this? So you have uh, so your group G, we assume it's uh, residually finite and it's the smallest number such that two words not equal in the group of lengths at most n are separated by a homomorphism uh, to, to a finite group H of, of size this number. So it's the index of the subgroup where you can separate these two given words from the ball of radius n. So that's precisely what, what the second part of mckinsey maltzev algorithm does. It looks where you can separate. So if, if this is huge, it means mckinsey maltzev second part of mckinsey maltzev algorithm will, will work very long. I, I, I have to say that den functions, the depth function, they are, they are good for many other reasons, not related to algorithmic questions and they studied in geometry group theory now. I will say a few words about this. But first of all, it was not known how hard could be a word problem in finitely presented uh, residually finite groups. So most of the many that we know residually finite groups are linear the word problem is easy, it's polynomial time. And uh, here we proved that if you're given a computable function, you can find, you can, there exists a group, actually you can construct it, such that the 
time function of any decision algorithm for for g will be at least f of n for for all n starting with some for sufficient for sufficiently large so it it could be really bad so the den function that was the question that people started to think about in eight, uh, late, uh, late 80s and early 90s and uh, groups with solvable word problem it was known can can have very large den functions smart linear on otta in different language and appeared Berger and Reeves in 2002 that's that's much more information here it's a great paper um, if you consider just not arbitrary groups but residually finite strangely the best what was known is just exponential den function N nothing more than that and even for linear groups uh, question of Gerson is there a uniform upper bound for then functions of linear groups so it's not known uh, I'm not saying exponential or something just any comp computable bound turns out it's uh, still open and it's wide open and what is interesting about rigidly finite groups all methods to construct finite represented groups with high dense functions that were known before they produce non residually finite groups and it's, it's very easy to see it's quite often it's, uh, there is a Brightson uh, basically how to produce high uh, dense function you, you take a group with a highly distorted finitely generated subgroup and do something like HN extension then the, the word problem will be distorted a lot so it, so there are several known things it's uh, starting with boon novik of constructions where you have a mach Turing machine and you construct a group or Mikhailova construction when starting with finely presented group you construct some other group or Rips construction on, or Bryson Heffliger constructions so we just checked all of them to produce non residually to, pr to produce residually finite you need to start with residually finite which was already would be good for example risk construction starts with some finely presented group so if the construction gives a residually finite group this finitely initial finitely presented group should be residually finite so it does not really work all these constructions so it should be something new Um, so a couple of examples the famous bomb sucks solitaire group metabillion uh, all metabillion groups are easily finite so it's uh, then function is exponential and Neil Potten groups they have polynomial then functions so these are examples which were known uh, there are examples of exponential then functions more than that but that's typical actually this group is finely presented in the class of all groups but if you consider all finitely generated metabillion groups which are finely presented in the class of metabillion groups if you adjust the definition saying I, I count only relations which are in the variety so in the class of metabillion groups then functions in this inside the class of metabillion groups uh, we showed recently with Sasha Ushakov that uh, they all at most exponential and for this group uh, the metabillion then function is still exponential for this one yes yeah no, yes it's known that it's exponential cannot be less okay so now the theorem
supposed to be, oops. I wanted to put item by item, but in any case. So the first item shows that given a recursive function, computable function f, there is a residually finite, finitely presented, happen to be solvable of class three group G, such that it's then function at least fn for almost all n. In other words, it, it could be arbitrary high computable function. So it's then functions are actually could be really, really large. It doesn't mean that the word problem could be difficult, but the second item shows that you can actually do it independently. I didn't write it, but you can have then function more than f of n and uh, with the word problem could be arbitrary high g of n. In particular, that's interesting result that there are groups like that with polynomial time word problem. So then function is, is huge, but uh, the word problem is actually very easy. So there is no really close dependence, even as a class of residually finite groups. So if you look about all the, the books or papers about then functions, they say it's a witness. I, indeed, it's a witness of the word of positive part. To write down trivial word clearly that it's trivial, it's as a product of conjugates of relations. You need then function. But to solve the word problem, you, you don't need it. So it's more interesting. Okay, that's, that's the first one shows whatever you want, you can have in the class of finitely presented residually finite groups with respect to then function. Not where, wherever you want, whatever you want. Because you can, it would be good that to, to, have, to say that it's equal to Fn up to some, some small perturbation, but that it's not, it's not here. And, uh, so yeah, yeah, I will. You, I will don't, you don't use the then function, right? You use something else. Right? Yeah, I will, I will get to it. Uh, the same method for all the results I present in the second part. So depth. So you can have re residually finite, finitely presented group with arbitrary large depth function. So to separate into finite group, you can, it, it will, you have to go very far, as far as you, as Fn, arbitrary computable function. In particular, McKinsey algorithm, in some cases, it, it, it works as long as you want. And the same thing for the word problem and the same thing for the, so depth function is not related to the, is not very much related to the complexity of the word problem. Again, the same thing. You can have polynomial time, <coughs> word problem and very huge then uh, depth function. So. You can get all these combinations. So how, yeah. So one thing, it's a typical classical con constructions go coming from Boone and Novikov really. It's a, you, you construct a group that tries to simulate a Turing machine. So given a Turing machine, you construct a group G of M, which relations simulate the program of, of the Turing machine somehow. 
and there is an algorithm that for every input word u of the Turing machine, a, this algorithm, outputs a word w which depends on u in the generators of the groups such that m halts on u if and only if double u at u is equal to 1 in gm. In other words, it, it relates the halting problem for the Turing machine with the word problem in the group. And uh, Mark has a uh, kind of huge interest in machinery, uh, so-called S machines. So Turing machines are sometimes very difficult to simulate by relations. So there are so he constructed S machines, which are much easier to simulate in groups. But there is a very concrete reason why it almost never gives a, a, a residually finite group. Uh, so what we do, we use a different construction due to Olga Kralampovich of a finely presented solvable group which is undecidable word problem. That's what he, she did. And the idea was to simulate Minsky machines. So the idea comes actually from Slobodskoy, who did it for semi-groups. And Olga did it for groups. But she didn't do Minsky machines. Huh? Yeah, she did. She did, yeah. yeah. No, first it was Slobodskoy, then Olga and uh, Mark and, and Minsky machines are easy and, and there are now S machines. So what's the group? I don't want to, to, to describe precisely because it's technical and kind of too many details. But the group is split extension of elementary abelian group of prime exponent by metabelian group B. So by elementary abelian group, you mean what do you mean? Abelian group is... Uh, but infinite. Yeah. yeah. So the structure of the group is kind of simple. It's you have abelian group extended by metabelian and machine somehow works there. If you look at all the constructions used before, the word W of U always obtained by the word W which corresponds to the empty word for Turing machine, and then you put in uh, U inside, configurations for U. And, it, and it, it, that never works. So this is kind of different idea. So we used Olga's construction, but it's slightly, and it's actually in quite different way. Um, so we need Minsky machine and machine which is symmetrically universally halting. So they are halting all the time in, in, in computation go from input to the uh, final and back. So everything is halting and unique, sort of. And these machines, I don't want to, to get to the definitions, but you can characterize them as whose transition graphs. What is transition graph? You, you have vertices set of configurations, and edges are the transition from one configuration to another by a, a, an instruction of the Minsky machine. So such configuration graphs or transition graphs, they're just disjoint unions of finite trees. There are a lot of finite trees, so everything is finite, but it's kind of the computation process is disjoint. And since com all components are finite, the group that you get will be always residually finite. That's the idea. So if you look how, how it works, that's the main thing. And another thing is that any computational device, like a Turing machine or a Minsky machine, can be 
simulated by such machines. It's interesting that if you take arbitrary machine M, the group may not be uh, residually finite. But if you take computationally equivalent machine, which is symmetric universally halting machine, the corresponding group becomes residually finite for sure. And uh, we thought that it, we can construct residually finite P groups like that, but we, we didn't do it. Okay, that's, this is it. Thank you. That's a good question. So no, I don't know anything. Yeah, yes, we know. No, no. So uh, that's a very good question. So we know what's going on in important groups. Yeah. Yeah. We know what's going on in metabelian yeah. groups now. N now we know. And polycyclic, yeah, we don't. It's yeah, it's very natural and very interesting question. Yeah. And but uh, the technique, what. Uh, so you, you're going to get some kind of a secret uh, generated power of exponential uh, bound because of like the proper rank or whatever, no? Oh, that's, that's not known at all because they, they're linear. Even for linear groups, we don't know whether it's bounded or not. Okay. So if, if, if for polycyclic it would be unbounded, that would be answering the old question. So it's polycyclic groups are really interesting and uh, there should be new techniques. So bomb slug, short, uh, Uh, they consider, but didn't get. Uh, no, there are some. Uh, just talked to Chuck Miller, who was part of it. Uh, it's this research, so that they had some. Um, they thought they have. They had some interesting ideas, but nothing published. No, no. Is it, is it known that it's, it's known, known that it's you can't. Yeah. Um, because uh, just quick explanation, because being trivial is uh, Markov's property. So if it would be recursive bound, you would start looking for every generator. You would start looking whether they appear, and you are looking as long as the bound is universal bound. If you got it, it's trivial. If not, it's not trivial. But it's an undecidable problem, so it's, there is no any recursive bound. Yeah. Right. It's funny that the one you say, when you can't decide if it's trivial, you can't decide if it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Despite doing a nice little presentation. Yeah, that's, that's right. All right, thank you very much again. Okay.